Lesson 5 in the series, The Evangelism Model of Jesus and the Apostles. Today we're going to look at the fourth case study, the case study of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. What was his question? How did Jesus answer? How can we take these principles in approaching people that we'll call a moralist? How do we witness to a rich, self-sufficient do-gooder? Number one, determine who they think Jesus is. Is he a good master, rabbi, or is he God? Good master, why callest thou me good, Jesus said. There is none good but one, that is God. Jesus immediately dealt with his concept of who he thought Jesus was and who God was. It was obvious he did not think Jesus was God. Listen for clues as to the basis of their self-righteousness. What good thing shall I do, said the rich young ruler. And then we need to find out how they think they can get to heaven. That I may have or inherit eternal life. I've often asked questions of people, when you were growing up, what did your church or your pastor teach you was how you get to heaven? What do you have to do? I want to find out what they have been taught. And then I often followed up with the question, do you believe that or do you do that? The rich young ruler, scripturally, we see that there had to be a definition of righteousness. It doesn't mean to sin less, but rather to be sinless. Let's look at chapter 19, verse 17. If thou wilt enter into life, Jesus said, keep the commandments. Hmm, this is interesting. Now, obviously, Jesus, in many other places, and consistently all through the epistles, did not teach that you could keep the commandments and enter into eternal life. He was taking this man where he was. His definition was, what can I do to get to heaven? So it's very safe to assume, based on Jesus' reply here, that he obviously believed heaven was by his personal keeping of the commandments. Jesus is not confirming that. Jesus is starting where he is. All the scriptures clear about this. Why would Jesus say this in a way that others could infer that Jesus was implying salvation, interest into heaven was by good works? It is more effective to ask questions that reveal the flaw in people's assumptions rather than to rebuke them outright. He dealt first with the scriptural truth of the universal sinfulness of mankind. There is none good but God. We could quote verses like, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Or there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Or all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Many verses indicate our complete guilt and inability to obtain righteousness within ourselves. And then we need to expose the futility of selective obedience to God's commandments. Jesus listed the six of the commandments that deal with human relationships. He summarized the last one on coveting with the golden rule, referring to Exodus 20, 17. And then he replied to Jesus, which commandments? The first four commandments are vertical toward God. Sabbath keeping is observable, but the next three are not as observable. They are internal, subjective. These six can be shown and judged by observation. So that's what gets emphasized in religion, external righteousness that can be measured, righteousness that can be observed or be impressive to mankind. We need to understand the blindness of self-righteousness that good, their good, can outweigh their sin. In Matthew 19, 20, he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? He was pretty sure of himself that he was checking off all the boxes. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, Solomon said, There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. People are hung up on the parts that they do that are good somehow figuring that that outweighs the bad or appeases God for the bad they have done. This usually is the point at which the Lord alone, from the Word, by the Spirit, has to reveal it to unsaved religious self-righteous types. 
reading the Gospel of John or the Epistle of Romans can be suggested. Don't argue with them. Uh, thank them. Let them know you're interested in talking with them again. Remember this. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. God's law, literally the law of Moses, is excellent, the only source of bringing conviction, pointing out someone's failure to keep the law. It's not just 10 laws, but 613 commandments. It's overwhelming if someone will be exposed to the actual Word of God, even just the Ten Commandments, they find that they are not righteous. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We have a very effective weapon. Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. There's a process of the schoolmaster bringing the student to the teacher, in this case, the Savior. We need to let that work. We need to do our part and come back and follow up. But it's essential that the scriptures be allowed by the Holy Spirit to convict people of their sin. In this case, the young man came to Jesus and asked. Jesus' outlandish demand of internal perfection revealed that he was covetous. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, teleos means complete in moral character, you ask what you lack. You, you are to be so righteous you are not lacking anything? Jesus tested the last command forbidding covetousness by asking him to surrender his material wealth to benefit others. He failed the test because his possessions, not God, possessed his heart. As I said earlier, Warren Buffett recently made the statement after giving most of his wealth away, there's more than one way to get to heaven, but this is a great way. The folly of that seems ridiculous to us, but we must peel away the layers of the onion to find out these type of things that people are holding on to for their salvation. Jesus said, sell that thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He could have stopped and asked, what do you mean by that? Are you saying that this gives me eternal life? It could be that Jesus was emphasizing not only his covetousness, but the same message that he probably heard from his rabbis, and that giving to charity would earn him righteousness, though not giving to all, giving all of their belongings to charity. No rabbi was teaching that. There's no record of that in history. Even if he passed Jesus' test for this last commandment, he still lacked internal righteousness. He asked, is there anything else? Jesus changed the emphasis from commission of sin to the omission of the commandments. People are very proud of the few that they can show off that they keep, but we need to deal with the whole gospel, with the whole emphasis of the law. They were to keep all of the law from the letter of the law to the spirit of the law even. Unlike religiosity, true heart righteousness is not how many bad things we don't do or how many good things we do. It can only be imputed by God through faith like with Abraham. Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter in the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Is it possible? Certainly. Is it difficult? Yes. Why? Many people assume, since I have been blessed financially, certainly God's paying me back for my good behavior. Very common for people to think that. We must trust the power of the Word and the Spirit to save people. After all, it saved Paul, the chief of sinners, known as Saul of Tarsus, Jesus' disciples were watching this conversation, and when they heard Jesus' answer and saw this young man walk away, they were exceedingly amazed. Why? They said, who can then be saved? It was a common Jewish concept and belief that if someone was blessed financially, they were blessed of God, it was because of their behavior. We remember Job's friends, as Job's friends came to him and said, look, you know, nothing bad ever happens to someone unless they deserved it, unless they did something to deserve it. So therefore, Job had been blessed and rich because before this time, he had done many good things and God blessed him. That's not the case. 
But Jesus beheld them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That could be true of any person we deal with who is unsaved. It's impossible for us to convince them, to persuade them, to save them. We must allow the Word of God and our love and the presentation of the gospel be the tool that God uses to save them. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Next, we'll look at King Agrippa. In Acts chapter 26, we're dealing with a noble man, a noble man with a Jewish religious background. So the first thing that Paul did in this case was to compliment his spiritual interest. He said to Agrippa, I know thee to be expert in all customs. And that was not flattery. He could say truly that Agrippa was an expert in Jewish customs. Hey, find a point at which you can compliment a person for their devotion, although it be focused on wrong objectives. And then Paul asked for permission. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Very good point to be courteous and to ask people permission to share with them. Share your personal religious background, your testimony, as we would say. No one can deny you that. After you've earned the right by listening to theirs, after you've asked permission, then you can say, well, my manner of life from my youth, and this is my story. Someone can greatly disagree with what you believe salvation to be, yet they cannot deny you your story. You've been cautious to hear their story and courteous to ask permission. It's very likely you'll get to share your story. Next, we move on to tell our conversion story. Share the purpose and benefit of salvation by faith, forgiveness, and sanctification. Acts 26, 18, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wow, everything about salvation is in that tiny verse. A sinner receiving forgiveness of sins. Inheritance, eternal life among them that are sanctified. How is it received? By faith. What a tremendous verse. We need to come down to the point of a decision of repentance and faith in Jesus alone who can forgive us and save us from our sins. And then introduce the key issue of eternal life and proof of Jesus' deity. He said to Agrippa, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto the fathers. I'm only telling you the fulfillment of what the Jewish prophets said would come. And then we can preclude some main objections for the rejection of Jesus, such as in Acts chapter 26, verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead, putting the burden of proof back upon the person for one of their objections? Why would anything be impossible with God? If he can do this, then he certainly can do that. Scripture is full of wonderful things God did in the case of Israel. And uh, we can ask about their belief in those. Sometimes they don't believe those. But we need to deal with the resurrection of the dead, for Jesus Christ truly had to be buried and rise from the dead, or else it was in vain. And then we need to establish the credibility of the message in Messianic prophecy. Paul went on in Acts 26, 22, saying, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ, Messiah, should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Tremendous anchoring what your claim is back to to not your opinion, not to the opinion of a Christian church, uh, not to the opinion of a theologian, but to the actual prophetic forecast of the Jewish prophets. This is excellent, and especially in the case of witnessing with Jewish people, we must lay this foundation and go back and touch upon it as we conclude. And then we must ask if they believe the evidence that Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Allow their honest opinion of what they had just heard, even if it's to disagree. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? Or it could be read with, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Whichever way, 
whether Agrippa was saying, hey, hey, you're trying to persuade me. I know what you're up to. And bristling against that, that likely could have been his response. Or Agrippa saying, you know, you've really made me think about something. You're almost persuading me to be a Christian. Either way, that's one of those verbalizations acknowledging that this is heavy. This is causing me great thought. Uh, this is causing me turmoil. And, of course, Paul didn't end this conversation. As we read, the, the Agrippa, he had to move on. The king, he had other things to do. Paul was just a prisoner. But we need to remember to walk away, allowing people to be curious and hungry for more than giving them so much they wish we would just go away. A lot of wisdom we can see in these models of Jesus and his apostles and the model for evangelism that we should use today. Thank you.